Hello, good morning. I hope you can hear us now. Barbara, can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me also? Yes. Now everyone I think can a lot of. Okay. Great. Okay. So we will start again. Thank you very much for joining the webinar. I see we have a lot of people from all over Europe joining us today, but we have also people from the Philippines, and we have actually Marie, one of our presenters today, joining us from Kenya. Marie, I will just ask you to please turn off your audio for a while. And please feel free to write any questions and to write um, any, any questions you have and any ideas in the chat box and to interact with, your, uh, with the other participants. Meanwhile, I wish you a happy European Day of Parks. So today we are celebrating the diversity, the natural and cultural diversity in our European protected areas. And there are several hundreds of activities going on all over Europe. You have now started to answer uh, a short questionnaire that I've put on for you, just to know your knowledge about protected areas in Europe. So when was the first national park established and where was it established? So I'm collecting your votes. And meanwhile, let me just add that this is a great pleasure to be together with Panorama Solutions organizing a webinar. Uh, both Europark and Panorama have started their own programs um, last year and this, this time for the 24th of May we decided to come together to share with you solutions from the two corners of Europe. So today we will be hearing a solution from Portugal and a solution from Armenia. For those who are facing issues on the volume, we highly advise you to use a headset. Anyway, I will try to increase a bit my volume, so maybe you can hear me better now. Okay, so thank you very much for your answers. I'm very satisfied with, your, with the results. So yes, you, the majority said that the first national parks was created, were created in 1909, and this is correct. However, not everyone, not everyone uh, guessed where was it created? So the first national parks in Europe were created in Sweden in 1909. And this is the reason why we celebrate European Day of Parks on the 24th of May. Actually, it was not only one park, but two parks. The second national parks created in Europe were created in Switzerland. So half of you also guessed that. So congratulations. Meanwhile, the European Day of Parks uh, was launched by the European Federation in 1990. And the idea is to connect people to nature. So we invite all protected areas across Europe to organize their events, to call their community to parks, and to provide a, mem a memorable experience in nature, but also to highlight the important role of our protected areas. This year, this year especially, we are celebrating the European Year of Cultural Heritage. You probably know that the European Commission designated 2018 as the year to protect our cultural heritage. So we have um, challenged our members across Europe to organize events that can highlight the, the connection between nature and culture. We have produced tools in 25 languages and we have over 200 events in and around being organized in and around the today uh, and the next coming weeks. And you can see in the map, we even have events out of Europe. We have an event in Israel, and we have also an event in Guadeloupe that belongs to France. OK, for those who are facing sound problems, maybe um, what we always advise is to, use, is to use a headset and to check if your volume is on. That's also very important. Um, meanwhile, the parks all over Europe are organizing all kinds of activities from guided tours to seminars, fairs, exhibitions, and many of them are organizing activities with schools. So if you want to know more about Europe and the parks and eventually find an event close to you this weekend, you can check it online under europark.org slash Europe and the Parks. 
Okay, and this is also a very important week for all protected areas in Europe. On the 21st of May, we have celebrated the Natura 2000, and the day after the international, was the International Day of Biological Diversity. Meanwhile, it's also going on in Brussels at the same time, the European Green Week. It's uh, a series of events organized by the European Commission that are taking place to discuss this year how uh, our green cities can provide us a greener Meanwhile, just let me give you a short overview of the Europark Federation for those who don't know it. Um, the Europark Federation is the largest organization of protected areas in Europe, and our aim is to support parks protecting nature. And we do this by bringing people together. So our webinars are actually an excellent opportunity to bring technicians together um, and to discuss on a specific topic. So we are present in uh, our members represent national, regional, nature parks, marine protected areas from all over Europe. And we try to make uh, sustainable nature valid by people. So we have started our Europark webinar series uh, a year ago. Um, all webinar recordings are, um, are available and you can download them under europark.org slash europark webinars. Also, the recordings and the presentations of today will be available online. So today, we will have uh, a short introduction by Marie Fischborn. She will give us an idea of what the Panorama Solutions is about. And then we'll hear two practical solutions from Portugal and from Armenia. Uh, it is very important that throughout the presentations, you use the chat box to refer your questions either to Asosena or to Eva, the presenter today. Because in the end of the presentations, we'll have a short debate to exchange ideas um, and we will try to answer all your questions. So I wish you a very productive webinar. And I will give now the floor to Marie Fischborn. Marie is um, the coordinator of the Panorama Solutions uh, for a Healthy Planet Initiative. Um, and she, she has a long um, career in conservation, so she has been working in several projects all over the world, and now she's focused on um, creating and sharing solutions. So, Marie, the floor is yours. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, excellent. It seems everyone can hear me. Thank you for confirming. Uh, and um, good morning, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome from my side as well. Uh, I actually work for IUCN, the International Union Conservation of Nature. And Panorama Solutions for a Healthy Planet is a joint initiative which we implement with a range of partners. So I'm going to give you a brief overview of what Panorama really is before we move into the two really interesting case studies. So I mentioned this is a partnership initiative and the aim behind Panorama is to facilitate learning from success in conservation and sustainable natural resource use. Through Panorama, we collate, document, and share solutions, specific examples, that showcase how nature conservation can benefit society. And it is about giving recognition and visibility to approaches, organizations, and people that are successful and that have developed such solutions, but also to support the broader application of these successes. So the so-called solution providers can increase the leverage and impact of their work and also they gain visibility through being promoted as part of this global initiative. But they also go through a process of self-reflection and self-learning through the structured case study format that we have developed. The so-called solution seekers can benefit from Panorama by avoiding to reinvent the wheel, for example, when designing new projects or conservation initiatives, 
but this is also just a source of inspiring stories, for example, for journalists. We also see the solutions potentially informing research and analysis of conservation approaches in a particular region, for example, and informing policy and helping to understand trends. So one unique aspect of Panorama, because there are a lot of case study platforms initi and initiatives out there, but one thing that is probably unique about what we do is this case study format, which is really focused on replicability. So we ask the solution providers to identify and describe the core components that make this approach or BB here in the diagram. It can be more or less than four, so this is just an example. But it's really about drilling down to the essence of what, which activities, which parts of the project or the initiative made all the difference. And we look for the common elements that constitute success in these case studies. So this can be things like involving all relevant stakeholders uh, that should be consulted in uh, managing a particular protected area, or setting up a sustainable financing mechanism. And then the building blocks of a particular solution will describe how that was specifically done in that particular example. So all solutions are documented in this standardized format. We currently have around 380 case studies and continuously growing with over a thousand unique building blocks. And a solution seeker, as we call them, can then take one of these building blocks or several, recombine them with each other, of course, adapt or her own local context, and, uh, and thus build uh, on existing success. Our criteria for solutions are very broad. You can see them here on the slide, and this is deliberately so. They are designed to be, to be very inclusive, but principally, we think a solution is a tool, a method, a process, an approach. Often it's a project or a component of a project that works and that can inspire action. And it must have had an impact on uh, biodiversity conservation. So it must be more than just an idea or something that's at a very initial stage of implementation. At least certain elements of the solution must be scalable or replicable, so they can be applied in other geographic contexts or at a broader geographic scale. And also they should address conservation and development challenges in an integrated manner. And we then have more detailed quality criteria for what constitutes a good solution description. We also have a review process for these case studies. But principally, any project or approach that meets these criteria here on the slide can qualify. And very importantly, our solutions are case-based. They're specific examples rather than general principles or concepts. Panorama is currently a partnership of six organizations, GIZ, IUCN, UN Environment, Grid Arendal, RARE, and IFOAM Organics International. GIZ, the German Development Corporation, and us, IUCN, have a leading and coordinating role. And here you can see the logos of some of the institutions that have contributed solutions, and some don't even have a logo. This is just to show that it's a very open and inclusive effort. Our role as the partners carrying this initiative is just to provide a platform for sharing and exchange. So we're acting as knowledge brokers, so to say. And the contributors include a wide variety of uh, conservation NGOs, of course, but also government agencies, academic institutions, like here the University of the South Pacific. I love this little pen tool. Um, also, community groups like this one from the Solomon Islands, the La Rue Land Conference of Tribal Community. And we even had a municipality, the city of Stuttgart, contribute a case study. So the solutions are then being promoted in a variety of ways. We have an online platform, which is probably the backbone of Panorama. 
to reach the global community. And I will say a little bit more about that platform in a moment. But we also organize face-to-face -face exchanges between solution providers and potential replicators. And this face-to-face -face exchange is, is really crucial as well. So we have organized different types of meetings, fora, workshops. And we've also integrated solution examples into training modules to illustrate theoretical training content. Further, we promote individual solutions through various communications channels and products, including, for example, existing IUCN newsletters. We've also had dedicated publications, such as the one you see here on the slide, with, which had a focus on transboundary protected areas. We have a, a weekly social media feature, the solution of the week, which we often link to occasions like International Days or like the European Day of Parks, which we're celebrating today. And then, as Barbara mentioned, we have a webinar series. And I'm delighted that um, we have an occasion to join forces with Europark on that. Through this webinar series, we uh, run sessions around particular issues around every two or three months. Uh, so this is an example of a past session we had relating to gender mainstreaming in protected area management. Now let's take a closer look at the web platform. And I really encourage you to look at it yourself as well and explore it. This is really the gateway into the Panorama case study portfolio. All students are published there. And you can explore them in different ways. For example, using a range of filters or combining that with a free text search. So here's an example of the filters we have. You can also get an idea of the geographic distribution and search for solutions on a map. And of course, then you have the descriptions of the individual case studies, each of them associated with the person who is behind that particular story and who can be contacted in case you want to learn more core part of, of the description is are the building blocks. So uh, I described the format before. And you can then click on each of these building blocks to learn more about this particular component, how it was implemented, uh, what were some enabling factors to make this work. And finally, users can contribute their own example directly through the platform, either in an abbreviated snapshot format or using the full length case study format. This will then take you to a very intuitive, user-friendly online entry template, which takes you step by step through this format. And at the end of this, you can submit your solution as a draft, and it will be sent for you. A quick word on governance of the partnership. So I mentioned it's a joint initiative of currently six organizations, but it's growing, and we're continuously inviting new partners. It is funded mainly by the German Environment Ministry through different projects. In the past, we also had funding from the GEF, the German, uh, sorry, the Global Environment Facility. Um, and within that uh, joint initiative, it is then structured into what we call thematic communities. So those are kind of like focal focus theme of Panorama, which overlap with each other, of course. And each of these. Um, thematic communities has a coordinator, which can be one or several institutions. In the cases, it's a consortium, such as in the case of the marine and coastal theme. So the ASEAN Global Protected Areas program that I work for is engaged both in the secretariat of the overall partnership, as well as in the protected areas thematic community. So we have a role around um, identifying and promoting solutions relating to protected area management and governance. And it is now my great pleasure to introduce Asusena de la Cruz Martin. I hope I got that right. Asusena is the co-head of the Azores Department, SPEA, which is uh, the Portuguese branch of BirdLife. She graduated in environmental sciences and with, uh, with postgraduate studies in participation and citizenships. Uh, Asusena has been with the, with the SPEA, the Portuguese Society for the Study of Birds in the Azores since 2016. And she has developed studies on ecosystem services and management implications, and also coordinated the application of the lands of Priolo, which she will introduce now, 
the Lands of Priolo project to the European Charter for Sustainable Tourism. Welcome, Asusena, and looking forward to your presentation. Well, thank you very much for your introduction and for inviting us to present here. So I'm going to talk about uh, the work that the uh, SPEA, the Portuguese Society for the Study of Birds, which is the bird life partner in, in Portugal, that this uh, association has been developing in the Azores, more specifically in the lands of Priolo, for the last 15 years. So basically, this is Priolo. Here we have a couple in the picture. This bird is the Azores bullfinch. It's an endemic bird from the Azores Islands that can only be found in the eastern part of San Miguel Island. So it was very, very restricted. And 15 years ago, when we started to, to do this conservation work, it was critically endangered. <clears throat> There's been a, a series of uh, conservation efforts and, try, and uh, an integrated management strategy that tried to also link the conservation of the Azores bullfinch with the local development and the local uh, positive socioeconomic impact in terms of ensuring the long-term maintenance of this conservation work. Just so you know where we are, I hope you can see the map. So the Azores Islands are in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean and we are in the island of San Miguel, which is the biggest one of the Azores. All of them are pretty little, and we're in the eastern part, quite away from Ponta Delgada, which is the main city, and which is where the airport is. This area here has um, a special protection area, uh, specifically for the Priolo, and you can see uh, the restoration work, the restoration areas that we have been working on for the last 15 years. Just to explain a little bit of what was happening here and what was happening with Priol. Main problem, we had some problems before about the uh, degradation of habitats, but right now our main enemy is the invasive species. The Azores Islands have a wonderful climate and many species can just start to develop. They were brought for gardens or for other uses, but nowadays, as you can see in some of the pictures there, really, really spread, and they are a big problem for the natural habitat, which is the Azorean laurel forest, which is also the main source of food for the Azores bullfinch. So this is quite a big problem, and I will try to explain a little bit of what we did in order to try to recover the Azores bullfinch habitat, but also try to promote some local development in the area. So first of all, most uh, <coughs> logical uh, first approach. We are working with ecological restoration of natural habitats, mainly in the Azores laurel forest, which is the, um, the main habitat for, for the Azores bullfinch. We do so by removing chemically invasive alien species. It needs to be done with uh, herbicides because of the high slopes in which we work. There's no possibility of doing this manually. In the, in the large forest, we use uh, soil stabilis stabilization techniques with natural engineering, which you can see here in the picture, in some areas, so that we don't have an impact on the soil and we don't lose the soil. And then we replant with native and endemic species. We also did restoration of the peatlands, not so much because of the Azores bullfinch, but because it's another priority habitat in the area, which is very important in terms of water management and water regulation in the area. So in this peatland area, we managed the grazing cattle that was inside the peatlands that were drained for the cattle. We removed manually in this case, because of the water, we don't use chemicals here. And then we close the drainage ditches so that we recover the water into the peatland and we are inoculating the mosses, as you can see in the picture. We call them hamburgers. We put some hamburgers of peatland mosses that afterwards grow and fill the peatland. So that would be our first building block, ecologically restoring the natural habitats. For that, 
we need to produce, to produce uh, a lot of native and endemic plants, which were initially not very, it was not very developed, the technique for producing native and endemic species. Right now, we uh, have a production of uh, 40,000 40, plants and around 160 kilograms of seeds per year because we, we plant, but we also spread seeds in order to recover, especially for the herbaceous plants. And the forestry services have increased very much their production of native and endemic species also, and they give us some plants to put in the restoration areas. But we also need to monitor either the storage pulpit population, so that we know if how we are impacting the population, but also the restoration success. We monitor the pulpit, vegetation development, and water, especially because of the chemicals. We have a close monitoring on the water to make sure we have no impact with that. And in case we identify some problems, we, we can promote correction actions if necessary. So this is the main restoration and nature conservation area. But the project also has the social component. We have since 2000, uh, basically since the beginning, we have an environmental education program that's led for all levels of education, basic education and also informal, informal education. And we also invite teachers and we do teachers training in order to promote that they use our, ex our example and visit the area for their education. They adapt it to the educational curriculum and we also give them some tools to do this work. And simultaneously, we developed an awareness raising and information program for the local and foreign visitors with a communication strategy that aims from social media to normal media, and we also develop general public activities so that we invite people to know what we are doing here and how we are working and we they understand better what we are doing here because in the beginning this is a quite a remote area and it was not so easy for them to understand why suddenly there was a lot of people working in in those mountains that they didn't give much value about them so we have uh, the Priolis Interpretation Center, and I got the date wrong. It was opened in 2007. I'm sorry for that. So it's not 2013, it was in 2007 that we opened the Priolis Interpretation Center, which was a great boost to the awareness raising and an educational program strategy. Because it was more coordinated and there was a specific place where the people had uh, <clears throat> to contact us in terms of uh, environmental education and getting to know the, the project. So, and finally, the last building biolog, which was the one that started later. Uh, and this had to do also with the um, uh, existence services assessment that we developed in 2008-2009. We identified some of the ecosystem services that were provided by the protected area. We use this as a communication tool to let people know that they're not only protecting a bird, but also getting some other benefits from the area. And it, it has been a very useful communication tool. But we also identified that sustainable tourism could be a, re a really good tool to promote local development through conservation of the area. So in 2011, we started a participatory process to develop a strategy and action plan. As it was said before, we used the methodology of the European Charter for Sustainable Tourism, which is a methodology developed for a, quite a long time and managed by Europark Federation. And we applied it and adapted it to our local situation and at the present, we, we have been working with this tool for six years. We renovated last year the, the action plan and the strategy. And right now we have 11 entities, which are mostly public, but some are public-private entities that contribute actions to the action plan and work together. And we also have 49 touristic companies that are effective partners. They, they commit with some actions for for a period of time, 
in order to improve their sustainability as a company, but also to collaborate and contribute to the, to the preservation of the protected areas. And they participate annually in those meetings in which we explain the actions that have been developed and we discuss what needs to be done next. So as an example of the 55 actions that were proposed in the first uh, action plan, 66% were fully implemented and up to more than 80% were at least started. We now have a new plan with even more actions, 77. <clears throat> so, um, finally, in terms of impact, I chose three very general uh, impacts. First of all, in terms of the Azores bullfinch population, it has it increased in the beginning. Now we have a, a steady population that goes around a thousand uh, since 2013. We have a stable population that goes around a thousand birds. Uh, so, it, as I said, it was critically endangered in 2003 when we started the restoration work. Right now, it's just listed as vulnerable in the EU CN red list. So, it's quite uh, an advance in the status of the species. It's not out of danger, but it's a good path that needs to be maintained and, and ensured for, for the longer term. We have been able to recover 350 hectares of laurel forest and 83 hectares of pit box in the area. And we also have been able to develop, to promote some positive socioeconomic impact in the, um, in the area around the protected area. There's no people living inside the protected area, but there's a lot of little villages around our protected area. This project has an average of 21 full-time jobs and, and we try to always invest locally our budget. Some, some things are not possible to buy in, loc in, in the island or in the lands of people, but we try that as much as we can, we buy it locally. And we have been able through the project to improve some tourist infrastructure, so, such as building visitor center and building some trails that are also things that stay and can be used by local companies and local entrepreneurs to develop more activities and, and promote this sustainable tourism. We have increased the international promotion of the Azores bullfinch, of the lands of Priolo, and even of the Azores archipelago. Because it, it, the conservation of the Azores bullfinch is recognized as a, as a good conservation story, especially because of this quick recovery of the, of the species. And we also promote uh, educational and scientific opportunities, improve water quality, mostly because of the pit bulbs, but also in the laurel forest. It helps a lot with improving water quality and supply for the populations, because although it rains a lot in the Azores, it's, they're, they're very small islands and um, vegetation is very important for water retention and to avoid erosion and landslide risks. So, also ecosystem services developed are, are quite important. In terms of reflections, as uh, it was said before too, there's no need to reinvent the wheel. Sometimes there are uh, methodologies already in places, you just need to use them and adapt them to your reality. Not just copy them directly, understand how they would work in your reality and how, how you can adapt them. There are developed techniques either for ecological restoration or for social involvement that can be used and can save you a lot of time. This is important when you're uh, living with uh, these urgent matters of almost extinct species. It's important to learn from your mistakes. We made mistakes. We have some of the first areas that we restored that were not perfectly restored in the first place. So it is important to, to be a little bit humble and understand that you cannot do everything well at first. You just need to learn from your mistakes and improve your techniques until you get it right. And I think that's been another very important learning from these 15 years. It takes time. Uh, we work with three life uh, program projects 
which is a European Union uh, program for the recovery of Natura 2000 areas. And even now, it takes time to see the effect and to see the restoration of the areas, but also it, it takes time to to promote uh, and to create uh, trust uh, with the local population so that they understand what you're doing here and they start to value it and see the opportunities they can get from it. So both ecological restoration and the social development parts of the project are slow processes that take time and need to be maintained. So sometimes five years is not enough, it's just a, a start and you really need to keep on the work for a longer time in order to ensure uh, solid results. Partnerships and knowledge share are also essential. We work with the regional government, with the forestry services, and we learn from each other. Some of the techniques we've developed are now used by the forestry services. Some of the techniques they already had were the techniques that we use for the restoration. So it's very important to try to promote this uh, sharing of knowledge and working together towards uh, the same goal. And finally, uh, long-term maintenance is always a challenge uh, with the, all the changes that are happening. It's kind of difficult. And although we have been able to do this work for 15 years, we still are not sure. And it's a continuous struggle to make sure that we can at least maintain the, the good work in the long term. So we are struggling with that. And if anyone has any suggestions, they will be very welcome. I hope I explained myself clearly. So thank you very much for your attention. And here it is. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Asusena. It was a very inspiring presentation. Um, I guess Marie would present now Eva. Marie, are you there? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Now we can hear you. OK, great. I was already talking. Um, yeah, thanks also from my side, Asusena. Really interesting case study covering a lot of aspects ranging from ecological restoration over awareness raising to tourism and uh, also thank you for your reflection and uh, the point about not reinventing the wheels uh, probably the mantra of panorama so I can see we we have some common insights there if you would like to learn more about this case study then check it out on the panorama web platform and you'll find a lot more detail than what Asusina pre presented just now it's now my pleasure to introduce our second speaker, Eva Mati Rossian. Eva is the deputy director of the Foundation for the Preservation of Wildlife and Cultural Assets in Armenia. She is also the director of the Sunchild NGO and the Sunchild International Environmental Festival. In her position at the Foundation FPWC, for short, she is currently scheming eco-village development programs in Armenia in collaboration with the Global Eco-Village Network. Eva has a certificate on protected area management from the University of Montana in the US. So we're now moving to the very other corner of Europe, to the very other end. And uh, Eva, over to you. Hello. Hello, Heva. We can hear you well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to the organizers for this opportunity uh, to speak for so many interested people all around the world. 
uh, and I'm honored to present uh, the Caucasus Wildlife Refuge uh, project of the first privately protected area established in Armenia by the FPWC uh, since uh, 2010. Uh, so the summary, the Caucasus Wildlife Refuge started with only 400 hectares of conserved land and now we have grown to 20,000 hectares of land, uh, of the land conserved and our main mission in the Caucasus Wildlife Refuge is preserving the healthy population of top predators restoring the endangered species and, of course, engaging local populations in conservation. Uh, our partners in this, from the very beginning, have been IUCN Netherlands Committee and uh, UK-based organization World Land Trust that funds similar projects all around the world. Um, so this was the first attempt to establish a privately protected area in Armenia because in a country with a huge post-Soviet Soviet background where the land governance was solely the responsibility of the state and involvement of the local communities or uh, the civil society in land management, land preservation activities was not a common practice. Um, in this background, uh, establishing the privately protected area, not only in Armenia, but in the whole South Caucasus and the whole post-Soviet space was a pioneering initiative which brought with itself a lot of challenges, but also a lot of joy uh, that being a pioneer brings. Um, so the main context of the whole initiative that also lies in the media power organization, uh, are combining uh, conservation with sustainable development practices in the rural communities and also behavior change, including envir uh, environmental awareness raising campaigns and environmental education initiatives uh, that are nationwide and target tens of thousands of people, including targeted groups of them, such as youth, children, and uh, women. And coming to building blocks section, so I have already mentioned uh, species and habitat conservation that is in the core of the activities of the FPWC uh, and is the core mission of the Caucasus Wildlife Refuge. Uh, we do this by securing wildlife migration corridors um, in the south of Armenia, that is a key habitat for uh, flagship species such as the Caucasian leopard, the, the one that you see on your screens at the moment, and also red listed species such as Bezoar ibex, Armenian mouflon, uh, and common species such as the Caucasian lynx, wolves, uh, badgers, martins, hares, etc. Um, so, the mechanism of securing the wildlife migration corridors is that we lease the land uh, from the communities. These are communal land and the communities own the right to manage the land uh, and at their disposal. And they are collaborating with the FPWC, giving the land by lease and uh, we're lucky to record the development that in the last year the last years the communities chose to donate their land for conservation on already having seen all the positive impact that our work uh, has been doing in uh, in the field in the communities so we lease the land uh, from the communities for a long term period or the communities donate the land to us uh, now normally for perpetuity and we implement the management of the area uh, by employing rangers. We have the principle of employing the rangers from the local, uh, local communities only to open workplaces. And we use latest technologies for monitoring uh, the wildlife 
camera traps are uh, installed all around the area and we have permanently manned three ranger stations already that implement 24 7 patrol around the area on horses cars or, or on foot as it as, as, as required excuse me um we combine we combine uh, conservation practice with sustainable community development because as communities are the entities also that we work so closely with uh, they are the ones also that seek benefit in a way so what we do uh, we have a multi-layer approach in uh, community development field. We uh, promote organic agriculture and fair trade principles as a way of generation uh, self-employment or temporary income opportunities for the local communities. Uh, the photograph that you see on your screens, uh, these colorful boxes that have dry fruit uh, herbal tea and honey inside them. Our production of a social enterprise established uh, by the FPWC as a poverty reduction measure in collaboration with the European Union delegation. And this production unit is uh, only one example of um, collaboration with the communities is now employing about uh, seven permanent workers in the production unit and more than 70 families benefited from it by water collection uh, and contributing in one way or another throughout the last two years of the project. Another way of working with the communities and having may, making them feel the benefit of being engaged in conservation uh, is a lot of uh, awareness raising um, work that we do, combining it with practical measures such as introducing renewable energy solutions to the communities that we work in, uh, or improving water infrastructure in vulnerable communities that have no access to drinking water or uh, irrigation water. Another block in our system is uh, contributing to national legislation improvement because uh, Armenian laws, uh, in particular in our field on laws, the law on uh, fauna, uh, has very weak points which allows for um, illegal uh, keeping of wild animals in captivity. And FPWC has worked a lot uh, to collaborate with the Ministry of Nature Protection uh, to lobby for amendments in the law. Besides, we have practical projects such as, at the moment, ongoing bear rescue project, which not only uh, allows us to save the bear from horrible conditions, uh, they are kept in like fuel stations or restaurants as pets, uh, and no proper conditions are kept for this and we are saving them and doing a huge information campaign that is now worldwide, we are doing it in collaboration with the International Animal Rescue uh, to change the behavior and start having started more than one year ago we are now at a place that a lot of attitude changed in this uh, direction and also the law a package of amendments is being elaborated at the moment and uh, we're expecting to have it adopted uh, already this year. Another contribution that we did in this field uh, was uh, research on wildlife trafficking because Armenia is considered to be a wildlife trafficking transit, transit zone uh, and we work with the government, also with the European Union in their initiatives of GSP+, to uh, 
to monitor uh, the convention's implementation in particular, like uh, CITES in this case, also the CBD convention. Uh, and of course, coming to the most important part, uh, the law on protected areas does not allow for uh, having a privately protected area as a separate category, which, uh, which is another challenge that, that we have faced. And we are working with the Ministry of Environment uh, to also have that amendment input in it. We were co-authors of uh, motion uh, 34 at the IUCN World Congress in 2016 uh, on privately protected areas, which passed unan unanimously in the in the Congress and was promoting um, promoting recognition and support to the privately protected areas and similar initiatives such as uh, community conserved areas in the countries uh, like Armenia. Also, I know that Latin America faces this uh, issue uh, with the same difficulties that we do. Uh, another block in our case is, of course, empowering people for, for positive change because uh, contributing to the communities economically uh, or raising awareness just is, is not is not enough. And in this block in particular, we have a target on youth and children. We have been working since 2006 in environmental education field, establishing the first environmental education network in Armenia, uh, including thousands of, of children there. And we're proud to uh, record the statistics that all the children that have passed through our Eco Club curricula, most of them have chosen their career um, inspired, inspired by the environment and conservation. They became like eco architects or uh, biochemists or any similar, and many of them are employed now with the FPWC. They are from rural regions from all over Armenia, and most of them are um, happily volunteering for all the events that FPWC has uh, throughout the year. So about the impact throughout our work, we combine the four dimensions of sustainability. Uh, um, it was mentioned during uh, my introduction that we're currently working on uh, eco-village strategy development uh, in Armenia and we're a uh, focal point of the global eco-village network and in collaboration with them we're developing, uh, loc localizing eco-village uh, specific solutions for Armenia. Uh, why I referred to it because it's also lying the, in, in, the, in the main core of the eco-village principle, very close to also ICCA or uh, Indigenous and Community Conserved Areas principle, combining four dimensions of sustainability to have a holistic impact. Um, so ecology or environment uh, and our direct impact in this is like 20,000 Hectares of protected areas, securing wildlife migration uh, corridors, uh, important burdened biodiversity areas, uh, and this area is growing. And drastic and continuous increase in wildlife populations numbers, because pre when we started with our 400 hectares protected land um, around eight years ago, uh, the wildlife was nearly non-existent in this area because of uh, wide practice of poaching, illegal hunting. Because the, the, our privately protected area is starting just from the buffer zone of the biggest uh, state nature reserve in, in Armenia. Uh, so an economy, econom economic segment is not less important because like since 2014, we have contributed to uh, more than 55 communities with improved infrastructure in renewable energy and uh, water. 
and dozens of workplaces and income opportunities were uh, created for the rural population, uh, having evaluated their uh, social background and choosing the most vulnerable ones. Uh, society has benefited uh, from our activities. I have mentioned about uh, the Eco Club network that we have. So we have uh, about 2,000 uh, young people trained in the Eco Club system, and they, many of them have become also local leaders, and many of them are serving as volunteers and conservationists and junior rangers. Uh, in the protected area adjacency. Uh, and uh, culture is an uh, inseparable segment of this. Uh, also, the European Cultural Heritage Year was mentioned, and I like really the, uh, the, the motto of it. So we were combining culture always in our conservation efforts to uh, through festivals, through uh, environmental art initiatives, uh, building environmental campaigns uh, with a reach out like up to 500,000 people. Uh, as the whole local media was involved uh, highlighting, highlighting these informational campaigns widely, uh, and also, many of them were highlighted internationally. Uh, Sanchild International Environmental Festival uh, was one of the big awareness raising campaigns that we have been implementing since 2007. Uh, this is it uh, in brief and about reflections. Uh, what I personally, and I think more or less all of our team has learned uh, through the year, through the years of our work, is that constructive approach and proactiveness uh, in uh, collaboration is very important, uh, as opposed to like demonstrated criticism. Uh, which is also very important, like environmental activism is very important, but it is a change-making um, tool very often. But um, collaboration with entities such as government, which, uh, with entities such as partner NGOs, are a tool that make the, uh, the, the, the whole work more comprehensive, holistic, uh, and sustainable. Another lesson is that sustainability starts with a sense of compassion. Mm, having conservation as our mission and our aim, uh, we had also real compassion uh, for the rural communities that we have been collaborating with. Uh, we have been very consistent in identifying uh, specific needs uh, in each and every community that we have been working with. Uh, and we have done a lot of work on a personal level, approaching people, uh, entering families, talking to children. Uh, and uh, this compassion is returning like a boomerang, because um, they have returned to us by being really compassionate about conservation now and proving that compassion by concrete actions. And another uh, lesson learned is that uh, as much as we work on awareness raising and as many people we involve in, in uh, the process, children and youth are the most grateful audience and uh, the ones that take the message and become bearers of it. So they are really uh, very strong and very genuine ambassadors for the future. And our experience showed that all the message that we delivered to them, they have taken, and now they are, they are stewards themselves protecting and advocating for, for conservation. Of course, there are many other lessons learned, but uh, as we have a time limit, I will I will finish with this. 
Thank you very much for listening and I will be happy to answer your questions. Uh, our solution is uh, currently under review, but uh, hopefully we'll publish already tomorrow so you can also read uh, all the details about our success story on Panorama. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Eva, for this uh, fantastic presentation and very impressive work from Armenia with um, impact uh, well beyond one particular site, but uh, impact uh, on national legislation as well and, and really pioneering work for the region, an example of how social development can be integrated with, with conservation, but also in itself, this is a great example of building on what works elsewhere with um, the eco-village approach or, or the ICCA's uh, model and adapting this to a local context. So we now have uh, some time to address fantastic questions that have been submitted and I'm going to hand over to Barbara to moderate this. Okay, thank you very much, um, Marie, and thank you very much, Susena and Eva, for your presentations. Um, thank you also to all the participants for the questions. You can still write down questions, but please don't forget to address them to either Eva or uh, Susena, or even to Marie if you have any question you would like to 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 have an answer from Marie. So, Susena, I will start with you with a question from Luke Edwards. Uh, could you please tell us um, how is the management of the area financed? How, uh, how are you able to get funds for the conservation projects you are implemented? Hello. Uh, yes, uh, so to the moment it's being financed by the LIFE program of the European Union uh, with co-financement by the regional government. Okay, most of the work that we have been developing has been possible thanks to the contribution of the European Union. Um, and that's, that I, that's one of the reasons that I was saying long-term maintenance is always a challenge. Right? If projects are for five years, tops, so we are always trying to find new tools. We do have some return from the work that we have been doing, but it is not enough uh, so far to ensure uh, an adequate maintenance of the area. Uh, it gets cheaper. If we do a good work in the restoration, maintenance gets a lot cheaper and easier because the natural vegetation protects the re-entrance of the invasive species. However, it's necessary to, uh, every five, six years at least, do some maintenance in the already restored areas to make sure that we don't have reinvasion, because the problem of invasive species is not only in our protected area, it's a big problem in all the island of San Miguel. So, yeah, that's basically how we finance it and the problems we have with the financement, which are already a challenge that we are trying to overcome. And are you also trying to find mechanisms through sustainable tourism to have some funds directed to nature conservation? Uh, we are trying. We uh, So far we have this partnership and some of the companies actually contribute uh, with their little contributions. But we need to understand that most of the companies that we work with are very small companies, familiar companies. So they can contribute and they're willing to contribute and sometimes they do volunteer work or they invite tourists to do volunteer work or they even contribute uh, financially to the conservation but they, they, their capability will not be enough to ensure long-term maintenance. We cannot think so far that it's going to be the tourist companies that are going to finance the work so far. We don't know in the future if some mechanism can be stated in a wider way, uh, and we can find this solution. But so far, it's not it's not enough. Yeah, not not the tour operators themselves, but basically, but may perhaps a visitor paying scheme could also yes, be a possibility. Yeah, that that could be that could be a, a solution, and this can be thing, but it it needs to be a solution that is thought uh, a, 
as the autonomous region uh, policy. Exactly. This more or less fades into the question made by Peter Krokos for you. Um, and he wrote, uh, how high do you judge the role of uh, local tour operators to make the project a success? So you mentioned they are involved in volunteer activities, but they are also ambassadors and supporters yes. of the measures? Yes, they are. Yes, they are. They are ambassadors. They, they actually, they believe in the project and they're a very useful support uh, base for us because they, they understood that the conservation and the maintenance of the air is very important for them too. So they, they also do kind of help us do the lobby that this needs to be maintained and that this is important. So the, apart from their contribution to, to the protected area, they're, they're also very interested and very involved in ensuring that we can continue the work and can maintain the work that we've been doing. Okay, thank you very much, Mrs. Sinan. I will get back to you with some questions about invasive species. But now I would like to pass it on to Eva and to ask you, Eva, um, if it's about the creation and the recognition of your protected area. Again, a question by Peter. Could the private nature reserve um, also get a governmental status? Um, sorry, your voice was cut just in the middle. Could you please repeat the question? Sure. Um, I was asking if um, if your protected area could become um, government could have a governmental status, could have a legal protection. Eva, could you hear me? Uh, as a, you, you mean to become a governmentally accepted buffer zone of the state protected area? I can read this question. Is, is, it, is that the question? It wasn't before that if the private nature reserve also gets a governmental status. status. Okay. No, this is the this is the one one thing that I mentioned as one of uh, the challenges that we are facing that we want. Uh, that we want to have the status of privately protected area uh, be included in the uh, in, in the national legislation, and not only uh, the status of the privately protected area, but community conserved area, community managed areas like the private initiatives, saying private like managed by the local civil society organizations or the communities itself, so that the communities or NGOs are empowered to contribute to the uh, conservation as opposed to making it solely the responsibility and uh, mm, monopoly in a way of the of the government because this this is as i'm sure you know uh, a very much ex accepted practice uh, in europe in the us and it proves itself as being a huge benefit for conservation as a whole picture. But at the moment, we as a post-Soviet area and many countries like Armenia, and I've also mentioned, I know that they have the same issue in Latin America, uh, the trend of privately protected areas or community conserved areas is growing. And in many places, like in Armenia, I, I should mention that we do have the um, very positive attitude by the government. Uh, but we need uh, and we work together with our partners as well to have it uh, firmly uh, strengthened on paper and be uh, encouraged in the legislation. Okay, thank you, Eva. Um, so going to question to the second question of Peter, um, it could not be governmentally accepted as part of the buffer zone of the state protected area, or could it? Hello. Yes, could you hear the second question? Yeah, your vo voice was cut again, but this this one was governmentally accepted part of the buffer zone of the state protected area. Is yes. is that the question? Yes. Yeah. Uh, factually, we are in a status of uh, having the buffer zone of the state protected area. So. Uh, 
uh, because once the border of the state nature reserve ends, our area is uh, is starting. So in practice, uh, this is a buffer zone of the state protected area, and our government uh, recognizes it because our government recognizes. The existence of the Caucasus Wildlife Refuge as a conservation initiative, but still, uh, this is something that we need to have documented uh, on a legal field. Okay. Okay, thank you very much, Eva. Meanwhile, uh, if anyone has any other question uh, for Eva, please write it down. Uh, and in the meantime, I will um, ask Asusena. Uh, something about invasive species. So we have a question here from Emma, and she's asking if um, the invasive species are creating a problem with other endemics. Could you please elaborate a bit on what species in San Miguel? Hi, okay. I'm Sansa from Miguel. Um, yes, there are there are big problems with all the endemic plants and even some endemic arthropods and, and so on. So invasive animal species are a big problem in the Azores Islands, in all of the islands. Uh, I could say San Miguel is probably the one with the biggest problem, but all the islands have some problems with this. And it is not all, only about the ever, ever. It's a, it's a problem that involves all biodiversity. This, these invasive species are spreading very quickly. They've been spreading for many years. And right now, uh, many of the habitat, the natural habitats are almost lost to invasive species. Um, I could then enter into details, but into the Laurel Forest, we have different uh, high uh, altitude levels. So the lower areas are basically uh, dominated by invasive species. The higher areas are a little bit more preserved. So it is not only a problem of the Azores bullfinch, it's a problem for all biodiversity in the Azores. Okay, thank you, Asusena. And a question from Stefania. Um, well, you mentioned that you are using um, chemical methods to remove invasive species. Although we know this is a bit controversial, could you give us your opinion about that and what products are you using and how could you how can you measure the impact of the chemical methods you are using? Yes, I do we do we are aware that it is a controversial question and our position is that it needs to be used only if necessary, only in the smallest amount possible. So we try to in our case, if we were only to cut the invasive species, we will be doing nothing. They would just for sprout and be even stronger. So it's not a, a valid technique. It's not something we can do. So we and we cannot remove the roots. That would be the other solution because we have very high slopes and we would be producing um, very much erosion. And that could be a, a problem for, for the habitat, but also a risk for the people. So we need to use the herbicides if we want to have some success in the remotion of invasive species. What we do is we use the small, uh, smallest uh, amount of product possible. So we test it before and we know exactly how, how low we can go and it's still it's effective and we also do the work plant by plant with local application so we don't use it generally we have a field team of 15 people that go cut the invasive species and put the product on the plants so it's a very very specific uh, as an example i can say that with the monitoring of the vegetation we have a 99 percent of success in remotion of invasive alien species and we only get 1% of loss of endemic species in the same area. So we, we kill the invasive species, we don't even affect the endemic ones. And this 1% of loss that actually happens has more to do with the trampling of the field team while they go to the plants to, to remove the invasive species than with the herbicide. 
So it has to do with the technique you use and you need to have a very close monitoring. We also, as I said, we monitor the water and we monitor the water to make sure that there are no traces of the herbicide or the products we use in the water. We only have one situation in which we had a little trace and it was very, very below the, 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 uh, the level of risk. It was just a little small trace and it, we, since then, this was in 2008, we have never had that problem again. So it was a punctual uh, test and it was really, really low and we just made, took the solution so that it didn't happen anymore. So okay, I, I guess the, if you want to protect biodiversity, and in this case it is important for the source biodiversity that we do something about invasive species, and there's no other solution, you just need to use the safest techniques and make sure you don't have any other impact with that. That's our position in this. Okay, that's very impressive, Asusina, that you are able to, to remove the species without uh, affecting um, the, the local, the native um, species. So thank you for that, Asusina. I will now make the last question to Eva. Um, Eva, there is a question about large carnivores. So how do you manage the conflicts between the large carnivores and farmers and uh, shepherds or cattle producers? Uh, we do have the issue of human wildlife conflict in our area. Um, wolves and bears are the two large uh, carnivores that the farmers and shepherds are mostly affected by. Um, because the big cats, the, the leopard is, a, is very elusive and besides we only have uh, about nine individuals left in Armenia. Um, so we have been working uh, with the farmers, uh, also with the government about this issue, because uh, only up to last year we had this very sad practice of um, having the wolves uh, killed by the law. Uh, so, which which resulted in uh, very bad experiences, or especially on the background that uh, since decades there hasn't been made any uh, proper monitoring and evaluation of the wolf population in Armenia. Um, as regards our practical work with the farmers and shepherds, we uh, we have been working with our partners, uh, in particular our local corporate partner, which is the major telecommunications operator in Armenia, to uh, introduce to the, to the farmers and donate to them uh, as, a, as an experimental solution, uh, these electric fences for protecting their uh, farms or their stock uh, from the from the predators. Uh, this said, I should also mention that uh, our area, the south of Armenia, is not the doesn't have the highest percentage of um, cases of human wildlife conflict. We we face it more in the north. Uh, we're still working in it. We had uh, specialists. Uh, wolf specialist in particular invited from the from the Canada who implemented a monitoring in our protected area and we hope that it will have continuation to replicate this this uh, monitoring practice in a larger area. Uh, thanks to the effort of the conservation conservationist community uh, in Armenia and their dialogue, dialogue with the Ministry of Nature Protection. Uh, the practice of killing the wolves has stopped because it was really irregulated. So the, there was some a relative number, like 500 wolves can be killed during the year, but there was no proper license mechanisms for giving license to hunters for, for the wolves. Or, um, as I said, and there was no proper 
uh, preliminary monitoring and evaluation practice to understand if this is uh, at all an allowable number to be to be killed of the wolves, not to face the sad reality of the, the yellow, for instance, where the wolves were were eliminated. Uh, so we're still working in it. The, the solution of using electric fences uh, has different approaches by the far farmers. Some, some really like it. Some, um, some find, find it not, not very uh, productive. But I could say that we have a positive, positive development in this regard, and uh, hopefully our collaboration, our and our partners' collaboration with the government will uh, bring to a place where we have a strong policy shaped to um, apply a sustainable solution for this problem. Okay, thank you very much, Eva. Uh, it's very interesting the work you're doing also uh, with the shepherds, uh, providing them fences and garden dogs. That's also and one of the main measures being implemented um, in other countries in Europe. And um, if I may, as we are talking about farmers and shepherds, uh, just just to add to uh, my presentation and our collaboration with them, um, it doesn't uh, have to do with the question directly, but it has to do with our protected area management mechanism, because we have um, some zonings for sustainable farming for sustainable grazing in our protected area and uh, the farmers who previously had to pay uh, for having their stock grazing in uh, these areas have now free access because we grant them free access to these uh, zones that were identified as uh, proper for sustainable grazing or sustainable farming um, and they, by having this free access, they also become our agents and uh, our volunteers in, in this conserved area. If they notice any illegal activity in their surrounding, they are one of the first also to contact us and to uh, report about it because they already um, feel themselves as part of the team and part of the contributors to uh, to the initiative. Yeah, that's that's very impressive. Yes, uh, to engage them properly. Uh, well, Eva, thank you very much. Also, Senna, thank you also very much for your answers. We have no more questions and we are actually uh, a bit late already. Um, I would just like to conclude um, giving an overview of the case studies we have heard today. Um, we have heard our SPEA um, is protecting the Azores bullfinch to an holistic approach involving ecological restoration, but also monitoring the impact and especially bringing socio-economical benefits. The same um, with the case study that Eva presented with FPWC uh, working directly with the community. Uh, this example that Eva just said about involving um, farmers and making them and um, cattle producers and giving them the ownership almost of the land so that they feel the ambassadors and the protectors of the land, this is absolutely crucial. And these will, these two case studies are quite, quite inspiring. I would also like to highlight that both case studies are actually implemented by non-governmental organizations. So these two NGOs in Portugal and Armenia are actually being the active actors um, involving the governmental organizations and then bringing, trying to work together with the local communities to enhance social and economical benefits, but also working for a positive change, as Eva mentioned, and doing environmental education activities. So I find this was a great, great way to celebrate our European Day of Parks today. Um, it was somehow related with cultural heritage, but it's mainly related to people involvement for nature conservation. So once more, thank you very, very much, Hasusena and Eva, and thank you also very much, Marie, for having joined me, uh, for having had this opportunity to come together um, and organize uh, Europark and Panorama webinar. Um, I hope you have all enjoyed the webinar as well. 
thank you all for your participation and for your questions. Um, all the presentations and the recordings will be available tomorrow on our website, but you also receive it on your email. And meanwhile, I wish you a wonderful European Day of Parks. And do go to our website to find out um, an activity near close to you. So there are activities all over Europe and also outside of Europe. So feel free to go out, explore a protected area and celebrate the important role of parks in Europe. Thank you very, very much and see you in the next Europark webinar. Goodbye.